Welcome to International Trade and the Production Possibilities number two. In this one, we're going to come right to the end and show why international trade is so good. Look at this particular diagram. This is the capacity for the U.S. to make things. This is the capacity for China to make things. They're kind of stuck somewhere along this line, and so is China. In this particular case, we said the U.S. is going to make 40, 30. That's about how much engineering and toys they want, and you end up with a dot like there. And the China is going to produce something like nine engineering and 24 toys, so they end up something like here. And that's where the two countries are, on those two dots. Okay. Now we're going to move forward here, and we're going to show what happens when we have trade. Now remember, before trade, we ended up with this. We have the U.S. producing 40 engineering, 30 toys, China, 9 engineering, 24 toys. You add them up, and you get these numbers here. 49 engineering and 54 toys being produced in the world. Well, if you look back here at this chart, you could say to yourself, hmm, we want to be about here, but we're going to trade. So we're going to specialize just a little bit. We're going to do something else. The United States decides to produce 60 engineering and 20 toys. What does that mean? It doesn't quite have as many toys as before, but it has lots of engineering. That's not necessarily where they want to be, but you know they're going to trade, so they're going to specialize in their comparative advantage. We'll get back to that. They're going to go 60 engineering, 20 toys. What's China going to do? They're going to reduce their engineering output to 3 and increase their toy production to 48. So what's happened? The United States is kind of moving towards more engineering production, and China's kind of moving towards more toy production. What does that mean for world output? Well, let's take a look at a new chart. Let's say that the United States now is going to produce different amounts of engineering and toy, and so is China. You end up with new numbers, don't you? So for the United States, they're going to produce 60 engineering and 20 toys, and China's going to produce 3 engineering and 48 toys. What does that mean? That means that the world is going to get 63 units of engineering and 68 units of toys. Look at these numbers. Now I want you to pay very good attention to those numbers because look what happens before trade. These countries were making 49 and 54 together and now after they specialize 63 and 68. So remember before this was, what was this? 49. This was before and 54. Right there you can see the difference. This is a big moment actually. It seems simple enough or obvious enough to me, but maybe, you know, look at this. 49 and 54 is the old world production. Here's the new world production. This is bigger. This is small and this is a big dot. That's the point. But we still have trouble, don't we? Because what's happened is the United States has given up some toys so they don't have as many toys as they want. China's given up some engineering, so they don't have as much engineering as they want. So guess what happens? What happens is the United States sells some engineering to China, and guess what happens to China? China sells some engineering, I mean some toys, to the U.S. What they're going to do is through trade and negotiations, they're going to split up this 63-68 production level. That's the whole point of trade. The first step is you specialize in what you have a comparative advantage in, what you're relatively good at doing. That's the difference. So you get these bigger numbers, a bigger pie. And then you negotiate a trade of some kind so that you're at least as good off as well off as you were before. And really, you want to be better off. How do you determine that? You come back here and look. What the United States wants to do is be at a dot somewhere out here somewhere where they get more engineering and toys than they could by themselves. And China wants to be somewhere out here where they get more engineering and toys than they could if they worked just by themselves. Let's see if they can do that. It's actually pretty simple. What you end up with is, remember, 60, 63 engineering is the production in the world and 68 toys. Let's take the United States and see what they could do. After negotiations, they could be making 54 or we get 54 engineering. Selling their engineering to China, 
they end up selling their engineering and getting some toys back and they get now a total of 40 toys. So they have 54 engineering and 40 toys. How about China? China ends up with nine engineering. They get some engineering from the United States and 28 toys. Let's add these up. We end up with 63 engineering and 68 toys. That's the world production. But we have these new numbers here. 54, 40, and 9, 28. Let's go back to our charts. Let's remember that. 54, 20. The United States now, instead of being at 40, 30, ends up being at 54, 40. So instead of being at 40, 30, they end up being at 54, 40, which ends up being at a dot. Dart, sorry. Ends up being at a dot out here. How about China? China used to be at 924, and now China is at 928. So they end up being at a dot out here somewhere. This is the gains from trade. This is what happens in international trade. This is why economists want international trade so much. A country specializes a bit in something that it can do. The United States does engineering relatively better than China. Not better but they can do it in a particular way called comparative advantage. That'll be the next one. And they then trade and end up at a dot out here, somewhere beyond their production possibilities curve. We'll go do talk about comparative advantage next. Hopefully this thing will become a little bit clearer on this third and final one. And um, I'll see you there.